Uh, it's so good to be here. I've given uh, a lot of talks about this book and about Fox and about covering Washington, but I can honestly say I've never done it in the East Room. <laughs> so it is a real honor to be in the East Room of the Nixon Library uh, to talk about this journey that has been kind of a rediscovery of, of Eisenhower. And in that part, Nixon, obviously, uh, for me, I'll tell you how I got there and how I uh, came to get to this topic in just a second. Um, I started with Fox soon after Fox started. The Atlanta Bureau started in my apartment with a fax machine and a cell phone. <laughs> 20 years ago. 20 years ago. And uh, before that, I bounced around small market TV. And when I went to Fox, you know, people, I'd call for interviews, and I'd say, you know, I'm with Fox News Channel, and they'd say, so is that the Simpsons Network? <laughs> I said, no, no. I bounced around the Southeast, South and Central America covering stories, and I remember one day in Arkansas, I went to an airport, and a, a lady came up to me and said, you're Brett Baer with Fox News. And I said, yes, <laughs> I am. And she said, I love your channel because you report and I decide. And I said, marketing, this is working. <laughs> so uh, I knew that was a, a good thing right from the start. Um, I've had a tremendous career. I've been very blessed. Uh, covered the Pentagon for six and a half years, covered the White House for four and a half years, and took over from my mentor and friend, Britt Hume, uh, January 5th, 2009. Uh, and we have, knock on wood, been number one, number one cable news show uh, ever since. Thank you. So, how did I get to this topic? Well, I am a golfer. I played golf in college. Uh, I still play golf. I played in the AT&T Pro-Am at Pebble Beach last week. I am a four handicap, but I am a giving four. I am a walking wallet, essentially. I just hand over the money, but I enjoy the game still very much. I had one good day at Pebble Beach. Unfortunately, there were two other days you had to play. And um, my partner, Stuart Appleby, could not have been a better gentleman. We just missed the cut by a couple strokes. So it was a, a, great, a great week. Plus, it positioned me to be here tonight in the East Room delivering these remarks. So that's the prelude to how I get to this topic. So as a golfer, I get the holy grail of golf invites to Augusta National. And I am I'm just thrilled beyond belief. Um, this has always been a bucket list thing for me to do. This was about four years ago. I get invited down there. Let me just tell you how much of a golf nerd I am. As I'm going down Magnolia Lane with the trees, you're going towards the clubhouse, I am playing Ladies and gentlemen, Brett Bear playing his first time at Augusta National. A tradition unlike any other. Brett Bear could go for his lowest round ever. Imagine that at Augusta. Welcome to the master. You know, so I'm playing this. This, by the way, is my phone ringer. This is my phone ringer. That's how much of a nerd I am about golf. All right, so I'm obviously jacked up about being at Augusta National. And I get down there, I literally drive down Magnolia Lane, I get to the clubhouse, and they say, Mr. Bear, you are staying in the Eisenhower cabin. And I don't know if you've been to Augusta, but it's not a cabin, I mean, it's a little white house that was created for Eisenhower. He actually played Augusta 29 times as president. He, um, anyway, I go in there, and I'm really excited about the next day's round, and I pour myself a glass of wine, or, or two, and <laughs> walk around 
this cabin, this White House. There's a Secret Service quarters in the bottom, and there's uh, all this memorabilia, there's paintings that Eisenhower did, uh, there's statues, there's writings, there's books, and it's all in the decor of the 50s, of that time. And I just sat there and realized that as I'm at this beautiful place, Augusta, I think, you know, I cover politics. I'm a guy who covers Washington, and yet I don't know about President Eisenhower. I know about General Eisenhower in the war, but I don't really know a lot about President Eisenhower. So I vowed to myself after that round that I would go to the Eisenhower Library in Abilene, Kansas. And if you haven't been there, it's worth a, a trip. It's a little tough to get to Abilene. I'm not gonna lie to you. It's a little tough to get there, but once you're there, it is beautiful. Um, and I, I did go and I went and um, I made the trip and I talked to the folks there and I said, you know, there've been a lot of books written about Eisenhower, but what hasn't been written? And they pointed me to the transition between Eisenhower and Kennedy and the farewell address that he delivers January 17th, 1961. And I said, okay, that's interesting. Then they said, come with us. And they take me back to the library section. And this is where the National Archives is just such an amazing, resource that our country has and and the the things that you can find the gems the oral histories the documents uh, that breathe life into these moments of history is truly amazing so i go back to the library they tell me to put white gloves on and i'm like what what is happening here and they bring out this cardboard box and out of the cardboard box they pull a plastic folder and they pull it out slowly, and they open it slowly, and they hand me four pages, and I'm wearing the white gloves, and they hand me the speech that Eisenhower delivered January 17, 1961, with Eisenhower's markings, and the circles, and the emphasis. And I think about this moment, and him sitting at that desk in the Oval Office, and the import of that speech at that moment, and I think, this is it. This is the way to get into the soda straw of those three days in a narrative form and then jump back and talk about General Eisenhower and President Eisenhower's life and why he's important as a figure and as a president in the U.S. So that's what began what had become, has become a three and a half year journey. Uh, and I got a researcher on the ground who was fantastic, uh, a mayor, of a nearby town, Salina, Kansas, who spends her time digging into research at, at Eisenhower. Uh, a co-author who I worked with to bounce back and forth. Understand, as I'm writing this, I'm covering the campaign. And so I'm bouncing around covering primaries and caucuses and writing about Eisenhower. And um, it made for long nights and a lot of coffee uh, but it was a labor of love, and it was something that I really uh, discovered a lot about our history, and hopefully I'm bringing it, bringing it forward to another generation. I think my generation and younger, for a lot of us, uh, history started with Kennedy, and uh, there just wasn't a, a review of, of President Eisenhower's time. So you think back to that time, and it's often described as a sleepy time, a happy time, I mean, that's when happy days, 1950s, that's the Fonz. You know, he said, I like Ike and I like my bike. Um, <laughs> and it was a time that people didn't really think about the, the overall threats almost every day. Yet Eisenhower thought about them and Richard Nixon thought about them. The expansion of the Soviet Union, the threat of communism was very real. And the threat of nuclear war was hanging on their shoulder really every day. And you realize that the leadership that they exhibited during that time was something that didn't get focused on, but it was a steady hand on the till. So then you look back and all the things that happened during the eight years. The Korea War, you get out of the Korea War. You pass a civil rights legislation, the first civil rights legislation since Reconstruction. A lot of people didn't think about that when looking back about Eisenhower. A booming economy, 
Put under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. In God We Trust becomes the national motto and is printed on our currency because of President Eisenhower. Um, you have a national highway bill that creates the interstate system that we drive on today. And you have a situation where diplomacy is aggressive, yet not a single soldier dies in combat operations from the end of Korea to the end of President Eisenhower's administration. Then you think about the relationships that, that were made between the Eisenhower administration and Congress. Eisenhower comes to office and he has a Republican Congress, so, um, something that Richard Nixon did not have. Uh, Eisenhower, two years in, then has a Democratic Congress to work with and works with Senator Lyndon Baines Johnson as Senate Majority Leader and House Speaker Sam Rayburn and invites them over to the White House, sometimes once a week, definitely once a month. And you realize that over time, he is a humble leader. He talked about it in oral histories that we looked at, about why, he was asked why is, does he lead the way he led, uh, as general, as president. And he said, well listen, I, I grew up knowing that humility was a good thing. And he tells a story about when he comes back from World War II and he's being celebrated as a hero. He is doing ticker tape parades around the country and does them in New York and other cities and then comes to Abilene, Kansas. He's in the back of a car and he's waving to the crowds and they're cheering and somebody turns to his mom, Ida Eisenhower, and says, you must be so proud of your son. And she says, which one? She had six. <laughs> and he told that story saying, I was always kept humble. And I, I like to think my wife does the same for me. Um, Ida Eisenhower, by the way, never made it to see uh, Dwight Eisenhower become president, but he always says that um, it would have been exactly the same. He goes through uh, West Point. He's not a great student. He's not a great, he's in fact, he's kind of got some disciplinary problems. Um, he and Patton got the most demerits <laughs> in West Point. But yet he has a strategic mind and he can deal with people in a way that, that they can operate and feel like they are, are part of the decision making. He had the ability to deal with big egos. As general, think about it, he is dealing with the pillars on the earth at that moment. I mean, the Pattons, the MacArthur's, uh, the Bradleys, the Montgomery's, the De Gaulle's, and he gets them, these huge egos, onto the same page to get to a point where it's, it's victory. We found an amazing note from the night before D-Day where General Eisenhower writes, if this operation fails, and it very well may. It fails because of me and no one else. And he dates it accidentally July 5th uh, instead of June 5th. But he felt a sense of responsibility. So I wrote this uh, op-ed recently for Forbes magazine. And I, I think it summarizes pretty well the leadership lessons from Dwight Eisenhower. I said it's the seven business leadership lessons from Dwight Eisenhower. So first is be gentle in manner, strong in deed. You remember Harry Truman on his desk had the plaque, the buck stops here. Well, on Eisenhower's desk, he had a paperweight with the Latin inscription, gently in manner, strong in deed. And this really reflected his philosophy um, and pretty much his style. He was not about bluster. He was more about leading. He said, you don't lead by beating people over the head. That's assault, not leadership. He was quiet in this time. He, he was not somebody who yelled a ton. He did have an anger issue that I'll talk about in a minute, but he dealt with it in his way. The second leadership way is be a navigator, not an instigator. 
He said, he once described leadership as the art of getting someone else to do something you want done because he wants to do it. <laughs> and he had the way of crafting the words to be able to do that. Now, a lot of people don't know that in the military, as a colonel, he was a speechwriter. He was the speechwriter for General MacArthur. Dwight Eisenhower was. Now, when you think back to Dwight Eisenhower, you think of the description of him by the press as being this halting delivery, kind of dawdling president who played a lot of golf. And really, he was crafting those words. That farewell address, he worked on for almost two years. 21 drafts of that speech. It was 15 minutes long, delivered from the Oval Office in black and white three days before President Kennedy's inauguration. I'll keep going and I'll come back to that. Three, know what you don't know. He said, always try to associate yourself with and learn as much as you can from those who know more than you, who do better than you, who see more clearly than you do. And he believed it. Eisenhower was a collaborator. He wasn't a dictator. And he was somebody who today would tell Donald Trump to take every single intel briefing you possibly can. Uh, he wasn't afraid to say that he didn't know anything, and he wasn't afraid of dissenting voices in the room. In fact, he welcomed them, and that was part of this transition I'll talk about in a second. Four, don't let it go to your head. Even after the Allied victory in World War II, he was very uncomfortable with the term hero. General MacArthur was not as uncomfortable about it. <laughs> and Eisenhower had some dust-ups with MacArthur over that very topic. Uh, he believed that it wasn't about you, it was about us. And don't let it go to your head is the other takeaway. Five, take the long view. He said, it's a great feeling to be in the catbird seat, whether you've just won an election or experienced a great success, but experience in war and government taught that things can change on a dime and the mighty can fall before they rise again. No one knew that more than Richard Nixon who rose several times in his life. Uh, but he took the long view, Eisenhower did. He had five Supreme Court appointments in his two terms, five of them. Now, he would later regret some of them for different decisions that they later made, but he chose each one of them as non-segregationalist judges to make sure that that was the long view on civil rights. He never got credit for any of that but he changed the way the federal courts dealt with those civil rights issues. Six, never attack people personally. This one is a little tough today. <laughs> um, he once lectured an aide, a man will respect you and perhaps even like you if you differ with him on issues and on principles, but if you ever challenge his motives, he will never forgive you nor should he. He understood the difference and distinction between forceful disagreement and an attack on character. Um, and he made sure that that was the case when he dealt with people. Now, I mentioned his anger before. He did have a temper, and his mother used to get on him for it. And he dealt with it in an interesting way. He had uh, what's called an anger drawer. In other words, if someone made him mad, he would scribble their name on a piece of paper, like, uh, Bob, uh, and then put it in the anger drawer, okay? So, and then he would, you know, put it away. One of the things that, as president, that made him really, really mad was squirrels. <laughs> he hated squirrels. Why? Because he would go to the South Lawn outside of the Oval Office, and he'd try to swing his golf club, and he'd want to practice his golf swing. And every time he did that, the squirrels would get in the way. And he'd come stomping back into the Oval Office with his cleats on and talk to his secretary, Ann Whitman, and say, Ann, I hate these squirrels. And she'd say, now, Mr. President, those squirrels have every right to be there as much as you do. <laughs> and he'd say, oh, these squirrels. Squirrels. <laughs> Ann. <laughs> and one day, literally, he tells the Secret Service to gather up all the squirrels on the White House property carefully and take them to Rock Creek Park. 
And that's a true story. Your tax dollars at work. All right. Seven, be the chief morale booster. Make sure everybody knows that you're pulling for them. As general, the night before D-Day, he met with all of the 101st Airborne paratroopers, asked them questions about their life, where they were from, their family, talked to them. He said that he felt like he was inspiring them, but they were inspiring him. Because remember, he had that note in his pocket, knowing that the responsibility was his. But he said and believed that he appreciated the best ways to get others to perform to their best of their ability was to believe in them and that a leader is only as strong as those in his command. Now, those are the seven biz business leadership takeaways uh, from, from Eisenhower. This book starts with a meeting between President-elect Kennedy and President Eisenhower after Kennedy wins in the Oval Office. The book ends with a meeting between President-elect Trump and President Obama in the Oval Office. And uh, let me just go to the meeting first. Eisenhower was skeptical of Kennedy. He obviously was upset at the loss uh, and believed that Kennedy was on the campaign trail saying things that weren't true, including the U.S. missile gap with Russia, which, with the Soviet Union, Khrushchev has said that they were churning out mu uh, missiles like sausages. And Eisenhower and Nixon knew that not to be true. And yet he kept on saying it, kept on saying it, and it really made Eisenhower mad. Um, he finally meets with Kennedy in the Oval Office as president-elect. And he thinks, you know, I think this guy is a matinee idol, hollow, shallow, and that America has been hoodwinked. That's what he thinks before he walks in. Kennedy comes in. And Eisenhower's impressed with him. He thinks he's a thoughtful guy, um, engaging guy, obviously knows his material as they're talking. But he still has real concerns about how things are going because he, it seems, Kennedy, according to the oral uh, histories, the different documents that we found, uh, Kennedy basically didn't like the bureaucracy that Eisenhower set up, for, especially for national security those dissenting views in the room. He believed, Kennedy did, that you could make these decisions with a few counselors and his own counsel. Uh, Eisenhower was very weary of that. Fast forward, he delivers his speech, which I'll come back to. Kennedy moves on. The Bay of Pigs happens early into Kennedy's administration. The Bay of Pigs was in its infancy, started in the Eisenhower administration as a covert operation. But Eisenhower, in that meeting and subsequent meetings, tells Kennedy that three things have to happen. One, there has to be a Cuban exile government in waiting. Two, there has to be a leader ready to take over for Fidel Castro when it happens. And three, you have to have US air power that backs up these covert operatives that are fighting in Havana. Well, one doesn't happen, two does not happen, and at the last minute, Kennedy calls off the U.S. air power for fear that the world will realize that the U.S. is behind it. So it's a disaster. The thing goes downhill. Even the Kennedy people describe it at the time as a total disaster. The first person he calls, Kennedy calls, former President Eisenhower. And that is that iconic picture on the front of the book where... Eisenhower has flown to Camp David, which is named for David Eisenhower, uh, married to Julie Nixon. Uh, and he flies him to Camp David, and Kennedy is walking up the path, and Eisenhower is walking up the path. And both the Kennedy Library and the Eisenhower Library describe the conversation this way. They say Kennedy turns to Eisenhower and says, you know, you just don't know how tough this job is until you're in it. And Eisenhower turns to Kennedy with a smile and says, with all due respect, Mr. President, I think I told you that three months ago. <laughs> well, that day continues after that picture, and they go over step by step how the Bay of Pigs decision unfolded and, and kind of devolved. And from that moment on, Eisenhower is then a pretty trusted advisor to Kennedy. He's called a lot 
uh, during those times, leading up to the Cuban Missile Crisis. There's telephone calls between Eisenhower and Kennedy that have just been released that we used in our hour special about the book. Uh, but the point was, was that he wanted his successor to succeed, uh, but he was clear that he wasn't listening at the time. So that is one of the things that the farewell address was about. The farewell address was about laying a blueprint for the future from Eisenhower's perspective, a warning to his successor, President Kennedy, and also uh, kind of reflecting on all his time as a general and as president. A lot of people focus on the military industrial complex line, and I'll get to that in a second. But also in that speech, there is a call for bipartisanship, uh, that, that parties should work together and find out what they can do together before they argue about what they can't. Two, a concern about deficit and debt, that we shouldn't mortgage our children's future and grandchildren's future by what we spend today. And three, that in the world view, we should not get involved everywhere. If we do have to get involved, we should get involved with overwhelming force and then get out. Military industrial complex, he wanted to call it the military industrial congressional complex, uh, but he was persuaded by aides to leave out the congressional because he was making the bipartisan pitch and uh, didn't want to make anybody upset. Um, but he was concerned that the war effort had turned these companies into uh, operations that were churning out equipment for the war and then they were turning into their own defense industries and then pumping money into the body politic of America, lobbyists and lawmakers getting people elected and then some of those people would leave and lead the companies and there would be this cycle that continued that was outside of the votes of the American people. And he worried about the influence of money in politics. Now, you read this speech today, it's in the back of this book, and you take out the expansion of communism and the Soviet threat, and you insert radical Islamic terrorism. Its speech works today. It's very relevant still today. Some of the very same problems we're facing still today. So, in some way, Eisenhower was very prescient on his, uh, his ability to see that. Now at the time, the speech is delivered, as I said, in black and white out of the Oval Office. Um, it is three days before the color inauguration speech that is forward leaning and strong and the new President Kennedy is, it's well received around the world. Uh, the farewell address gets forgotten until years later when people look back at it and see how many things really, really matter. One of the things when he leaves office, the only thing he asks Kennedy for is one thing. He says that he'd like him to ask Congress to pass a bill to reinstate him as a general. And Kennedy says to him, why would you want that? And he says, well, because I want to be buried as a military man in my uniform. So Congress passes the bill. Kennedy signs the bill, and he goes from president back to General Eisenhower and spends his final years as General Eisenhower. I want to tell you about the speech writing. He was a stickler. He was a stickler about writing. So the speech writers, you know, there was no computers at the time, so poor Ann Whitman, the secretary I told you about earlier, had to re retype all these speeches. So, I mean, retype and retype and retype. And so she would preventively talk to the speechwriters ahead of time to try to avoid some of the mistakes that they were making again and again and again. So one of the things I didn't put in the book is a beautiful letter <laughs> written to uh, Bob Keevy, one of the speechwriters, from Ann Whitman. And if you'll permit me, I'll just read it here. It says, Bob, first, do not use the word merit as a verb. Use it only as a noun. <laughs> Second, never use the pronoun I at the beginning of two consecutive paragraphs. Third, this morning, a mild grumble from the boss on your using two adjectives, Bob, warm best wishes. 
Bob, you can make the wishes warm, you can make them best, but you should not make them warm best. <laughs> Fourth, never take it for granted that the president knows something about a national or local organization. Say, I'm happy to learn, or I understand that. Fifth, the construction not only but also is fine as in its place, Bob, but please, Bob, not in every message. <laughs> and this is the best. Six, and said, look, Bob, every time you use the word appreciation, you follow it with the word for. Haven't you noticed the boss consistently changes that to read appreciation of? So please, for my sake, Bob, for God's sake, Bob, when you use the word appreciation, never follow it with for, always follow it with of. So Bob Keevy sends back a letter and says, well, appreciation of means understanding, appreciation for means gratitude, and he's trying to explain it. Another letter is shot back. It says, you know, Bob, I just looked at the president's appointment book, and I see he has some free time at 2.30 this afternoon in the Oval. Would you like to come over and explain all of this to him? <laughs> he did not go. He did not go, but this is the best part of the story. Bob Keevy is leaving the White House, and he receives a picture signed by the president, and it says this, to Bob Keevy, with warm best wishes and with lasting appreciation for valuable service in the White House, Dwight D. Eisenhower. So it is gems like that, that just breathe history into that moment. It just, it just gives you a textual context of, of uh, the people, the people involved. Uh, Eisenhower did not know Richard Nixon when, um, when the party leader suggested that he be put on the ticket in 1952. Uh, but he had tremendous respect from everything I saw and everything I read. Uh, in the oral histories and other things, uh, particularly for, for uh, Richard Nixon's foreign policy acumen and his ability to, to uh, deal with complex issues, especially abroad. Uh, they, the two were never really good at expressing emotions, warm emotions with each other. They may have been with their families and privately, but with each other, there was not a great um, expression. Eisenhower often spoke of the value of Nixon and how meaningful he was to him, but we couldn't find many times where he said that to his face, to Nixon's face. And it kind of was awkward at times, uh, and the relationship was awkward at times. Um, they shared this deep appreciation for each other, but they, they kind of had trouble expressing it to each other from what we could see. Um, he, as often with many things, with age comes mellowing, and Eisenhower, uh, in his last months, uh, he was frail and living at uh, Walter Reed Army Medical Center, and he was thrilled that Nixon won the election. Uh, and he, in 1968, and after the election, Nixon comes to visit him uh, at Walter Reed, and Eisenhower kind of bucks himself up to greet President-elect Nixon. And with a hearty uh, boxer's salute and congratulations, uh, Nixon grabs his hand in that hospital room and says, the victory is yours too, General. Um, they shared this bond, but it was interesting, the, the relationship. In spite of uh, his health, Eisenhower kept on giving and was eager to give uh, President-elect Nixon some tips and some thoughts about structuring the White House and how it should be structured. Uh, and they had many visits uh, to his bedside at Walter Reed, um, especially on Thanksgiving Day. Both families came together. Uh, most important event, obviously, for these two families was the marriage. Um, and. David and obviously Nixon's beloved daughter Julie, the Eisenhowers 
always heartily approved of Julie. I interviewed Mary Jean Eisenhower and she told me, we just love Julie, we can't get enough of her. Uh, and that wedding was really important, uh, an important moment for the two families. Eisenhower was uh, too ill uh, to go to the wedding, um, but they set up a, a closed circuit TV that he could watch the ceremony in his uh, hospital room. And the, the best part of this story is that we found that during their honeymoon, there was a phone call late night in Florida, waking up David, and then on the other end was his grandfather asking, are the newlyweds still speaking to each other? <laughs> so he had kind of a sense of humor in that way. What I found out about Eisenhower was that um, he had an abiding love for the country, as did Nixon. And when you look back at that time, the leaders seem to be different. You know, they see it's a different time. Eisenhower's leadership style by Fred Goldstein called it the hidden hand. He was a bridge player and he didn't really put his hand out there uh, to tell everybody where he was gonna be on different issues. Today, it's a much different take from the White House. Um, Twitter is kind of the, maybe the shiny hand. <laughs> like look over here, look at this, Arnold Schwarzenegger's ratings, and then something's happening back here. Um, somebody asked me the other day, what would Eisenhower think of Twitter? And I said, wow, I think he would first ask, what's Twitter? And then he would probably say, get off it, um, because he believed less is more, especially when it comes fr from the Oval Office. The covering of the election, um, I mentioned how the book ends with President-elect Trump meeting President Obama. Well, you know how deadlines work with books. My deadline was three weeks before election day. So how does that work? <laughs> well, I had two endings. <laughs> so if you have the book with the Hillary Clinton ending, you need to turn it back in. That's the golden egg. Turn it back in. But I spent a lot of time, if you remember the timing, three weeks before, the Access Hollywood tape had just come out. Polls were completely upside down. So I spent a lot of time on that Hillary Clinton chapter. <laughs> and I, I thought, this is where it's going to end up. Here's what she could learn from Eisenhower. Here's how it all factors in. And I spent some time on the Trump chapter. But at the time, I thought it was really going to be good fiction. Uh, <laughs> So fast forward, we go through the, you know, from the escalator ride down in Trump Tower to the debates in the primary, many debates, and, and the most surreal debate was in Detroit where I asked a question about civility and the answer came back about the size of hands and how that compared to the size of other things. And I turned to Megyn Kelly at the time and I said, okay, moving on. So then you go through that, and then you go through the conventions and the nominating process, and you get to election night, and all the exit polls say, we're going to call this race by 11 p.m. Eastern time for Hillary Clinton. We were convinced. We were convinced we were calling it for Hillary Clinton. So about 9.30, I turned to Chris Wallace, and bless you, I say, this is turning the other way. These are not, these numbers are not lining up. And he then takes that and says, ladies and gentlemen, I think we should get our heads around President Donald Trump. Now this is about 9.30. That was my Chris Wallace impression, by the way. <laughs> Fox News Sunday. Don't tell him, do not tell him. Don't tell him that. Katie, that's my assistant, don't tell him. Um, all right, so anyway, he takes that, he says that, and all the AP articles say, Chris Wallace says we should get our, you know, like, that was my idea. <laughs> anyway, um, the numbers keep going, and suddenly we're looking at, 
well, she doesn't have a path to win. And it keeps going, and there's, it's kind of surreal. And then at 2.30 in the morning Eastern time, Fox and we call Pennsylvania for Donald Trump, and I say that means he will be the 45th president of the United States. So I say those words, and the, the shebang goes up on the graphics, and there's big you know, stuff, and everybody says, President-elect Donald Trump, and we all sat on the set, like looking around <laughs> in this kind of bewildered state, like, wow, this really happened. And Britt Hume and Chris Wallace, Megyn Kelly, the rest of the people on the set, and a few minutes in, I thought to myself, you know, that chapter really works. <laughs> Last thing, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up. Um, a lot of people ask about what's happening now. There's a lot of turmoil in Washington. Uh, it is rocky for the Trump administration. This was not the best week, and it's only Wednesday. Um, <laughs> so I think this uh, Russia thing is going to continue. I think that uh, there will be um, a lot of calls for investigations. I think there will be more trials and tribulations from getting his sea legs in the White House. I think that Eisenhower would say to the same thing that he said to Kennedy, which is if you go into a room and you don't hear dissenting views, walk out of the room. Um, and, but I'll just say this, that there will be tough times, but it's, um, I would not count out President Trump because of this. I'm not saying it in a, I'm saying it from somebody who covered him and didn't think he had a chance at one point at the beginning just because all the pundits were, were in the same boat looking at the same numbers. And I'll tell a story that two years before Donald Trump gets into, uh, decides to run, I played golf with him down in Florida. And this, I think, is indicative of, of the point I'm making. So I go down there. It's kind of out of the blue. And I say, sure, I'm, I'm going to play with him. And I show up. And I said, I played uh, in college. And he puts me with a partner. And, and he plays with another guy that's very good. And we go out. We play for five bucks. And um, I said, um, all right, this, this is going to be good. And he said, let's go. And <laughs> And so we tee off, and I birdie the first three holes, and which is like coming out of my shoes for, for that. And uh, my partner birdies the next two. So we are five up after six holes. And I turn to Mr. Trump, and I say, do you want to renegotiate this bet? He says, absolutely not. No way. No way. Mark my words. No way. So then, I don't get to do that much on the show. Um, <laughs> so sure enough, he and his partner start fighting back. And they're fighting back. And he turned to me on 16, and it's getting close. And he's like, you get nervous? <laughs> and then 18T, it is all tied. It's all square. And I remember putting the tee in the ground. He's like, take your time. <laughs> and we hit it down, and he hits on the green. I hit on the green. He has a 45-foot putt. And what happens? He drains it. He drains it to win. And I'm in the cart with him, and I get in the cart. And he turns to me and says, it's really quiet in this cart ride. <laughs> really quiet. I don't hear a thing. I don't hear anything. Brett, are you there? <laughs> so I hand the five bucks over. Okay. Fast forward. Two years. Through all the debates, all the coverage, all the stuff, the nomination, the last interview before the election. I have Donald Trump and Mike Pence in Trump Tower, and I'm asking them how they're going to win. And I said, you're six points down in Michigan. It's a blue state. Republicans always want Michigan, but it's like Charlie Brown and the football. Every time they go, it's yanked away from them. 
And I said, Pennsylvania's the same way. I'm asking these questions, and they're saying they're going to win. Cameras shut off. I stand up, walk to the side, and I said, no, really. With all due respect, how are you going to win? He says, Brett, I'm going to win. And I said, but how? You're way down. He said, Brett, remember the golf cart ride to the clubhouse two years ago? <laughs> so the moral to my story is that you can never count the guy out. Uh, so. Uh, I think there, it's going to be interesting times. It's like drinking from a fire hose in Washington. And um, I am one tweet away from having to get back on the air. Um, and uh, it's a lot of fun. It's an honor and a pleasure to be in the seat that I'm in. And to be able to write this book uh, was really an honor as well. I think it is um, hopefully uh, memorable for not only President Eisenhower, but also for President Nixon um, and, and all of your supporters to look back to this time. Uh, and in the inscription of the book, uh, I write this. To our sons, Paul and Daniel, and their generation, please allow history to inform your decisions in the future. And I think that all of us could stand to let history inform your decisions in the future. With that, thank you very much. And I'll see you from D.C. tomorrow.